الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله تعالى على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد في الأولين وصل على سيدنا محمد في الآخرين وصل على سيدنا محمد في الملاء الأعلى إلى يوم الدين. Uh, first of all, I'm really grateful for for the kind invitation uh, to speak about Sayyid Muhammad bin Abdul Maliki, and actually, you can feel the connection and a sense of connection with the Sayyid. I start to feel it. The first glimpse of the taraweeh, by the way, it's the closest taraweeh to how Sayyid used to do it, which is usually uh, people with different people would lead the taraweeh, and they wouldn't follow full khatim. Everyone will choose whatever verse that they want to read. But the difference is, Sayyid Muhammad would say, Ma'an, yalla, lead these two rakahs. So you didn't know before. <laughs> he would just put you on the spot, and you need to kind of to lead uh, the two rakahs or four rakahs or... Alhamdulillah. I think before going into a few points of reflections about Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi al-Maliki, which is, I found it a big struggle actually. Uh, it might be much easier if we have eight hours to speak about him, if we have a day to speak about him. That would make it much easier. But to have in an event where you need to speak in 30 minutes or so about him, I think it's a huge, huge challenge. The most important point in my point of view before going into his life is why do we study the life of great people? What's the importance? If we have the Quran and we have the Sunnah and we have the books, and what's the importance of speaking and being connected to the great scholars of Islam and the great awliya that we, we have in tradition? I think the first point, this is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us in the Quran, in Surah Al-Fatiha, that we recite at least, at least, in the five salawat, at least, if you don't play nafil, if you pray nafil and sunan, then you will recite it more and more and more. When he says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, ihdina sirat al-mustaqeem, guide us to the straight path. And then, why he does say sirat al-ladina an'amta alayhim, the path of those who, whom you guided, why? There is no need to mention it, except for one reason, that this religion was revealed and was transmitted through great people, through awliya, through salihin. And through the connection with them, you have an access to the essence of the religion, which is love and beauty. Love and beauty. Whatever you're going to explore, any signs of sharia, the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, fiqh, whatever, you will find yourself going into love and beauty. Love and beauty. And this is something you cannot learn it from books. It's not something that you learn from books. It's something transmitted from heart to heart. That's why in Sharia, among the least ways of learning and transmitting, for example, hadith and knowledge, what they call wijada. And some scholars accept it and some others they don't even accept it. Which is when you find the book, when you go to the bookshop and you buy a book without taking uh, at, uh, an authorization from a sheikh or studying for a sheikh, and you start to read it and apply it and probably spreading it. This is wijada, and it's the least. So it's not considered a valid way of learning and teaching. Why is that? It's related to the point I mentioned. Knowledge is light that passes from chest to chest, from heart to heart. That's why the Prophet Sallallahu when he said that knowledge will be elevated, and some of the Sahaba and some of the narrations in Tabarani and others say, how come, Ya Rasulullah, and we have the book, the Qur'an, and we have what we learned from you? He said, these things will continue to exist, but knowledge will be elevated through taking the lives of scholars. When scholars die, many things would die with them that probably you wouldn't be able to find it or learn it from books and from... It's about connection with... The light of knowledge, it's not about knowledge. Um, the best students of uh, Imam Malik, ta'ala, especially in fiqh, Ibn al-Qasim. Ibn al-Qasim spent 20 years with Imam Malik. Ta'ala. And he said that I spent with Malik 20 years. 19 were in adab and one year in ilm. And he said, I wished if I spent the whole 20 years in learning adab and etiquette from Imam Malik. Because this is the essence of, of ilm. And this is why we study 
the seerah of that. And that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to the Prophet sallam, that I'm, I, I, I'm telling you about the stories of earlier prophets لِنُثَبِّتَ بِهِ فُؤَادَكَ to make your iman fir- yani to, to make you firm in what you are doing. So this is the role or the importance of, of such um, connection. The other thing is, I think also it's very important, which is we are in a time and age, unfortunately, rather than having those role models as mod- role models for our communities, we have attack on them, and then the role models actually are becoming totally different people. People who are famous, but as, I don't know, stars, football stars, and probably actors, and, and so on. And even if they were related to Islam and, and ilm and knowledge, there are influences without essence of knowledge. And people start to follow them because they have millions of followers, people follow them. It's not about how many followers do you have. It's about the connection and the conditions of, of knowledge. Um, so human beings, and this is part of the nature, you find that in anthropology, in many studies, that human beings by nature, they resemble others. This is how they, they learn. They follow examples. So if we don't set the right examples, like these great scholars, people will find other, other examples. So to speak about those people and to reflect upon their lives and their legacy is part of that, is to reset the mindset of people about whom they should, should follow. Believe me, many of the examples and what, who are called role models once you get closer to, to their own private life, probably you would change your opinion about them. You would have a different angle and perspective. Our great scholars, totally the opposite. What they try to conceal and hide is much more than what we know about them. And you wouldn't know. I wouldn't say their reality, a glimpse of their reality, but when you travel with them or when you live with them. And then you start to see things which unbelievable. So what they, what they hide and conceal, it's much, much, much more beautiful than what, what they show to people. And this is one of the main differences between. What is between them and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, as I said, much more beautiful than what is between them and people and what they show to, to people. And that's why the best way to, be, to learn and to be kind of influenced by these great, great people is through sohbah. And they always, many scholars and many people will tell you about the importance of sohbah because, because of, um, of that. So that's why we speak about these great scholars and we remember them and we try to um, reflect upon their, their life. Radiallahu ta'ala anhum. I think... One of the ways to look into the legacy of person, people, is to look at their beginnings and their ends. And one of the greatest beginnings and ends for any, I think, scholar is for that of Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi al-Maliki, rahmahullah ta'ala. I'm sure there are others, but again, it's really great beginning and great end too. So he, as we know, he... He came from a, a very noble family, scholarly family. At least knowledge is known for the family, or ran through the family for almost six centuries. At least five or six generations were actually imams, judges, muftis, khatibs of the Maliki Madhab in Mecca. They inherited the same spot in the haram. In other words, they taught generation after generation. And even when Sayyid Alawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, passed away, Sayyid Muhammad father, the teaching session just stopped for three days. On the fourth day, Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi al-Maliki sat in the, in the chair and he continued to teach in his father post, rahimahullah ta'ala wa radiyallahu an. He started to, to teach before reaching the age of puberty, Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi al-Maliki. His father asked him to do so. 
And if we want to jump to his end, rahimahullah ta'ala wa radiyallahu an, I'm not sure if you know, but in Hijaz, because many people want to be buried in Mecca and Medina, in Jannat al-Ma'la and in Baqir. So they open the grave every five to ten years to check the body and then to bury somebody else. And they did so with Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi al-Maliki more than once, and his body was found as is. And that was the case for his father, Sayyid Alawi al-Maliki too. So the father and the son. And then they put a mark so that you cannot open the, the grave after that. If you look also into the ends, Sayyid Muhammad lived in uh, a country where he's considered, as we heard, from most of the scholars and most of the people as, as at least, if he's not, all what he does is kufr. Maybe he's not, no takfir mu'ayyan, yani, but at least all what he does is kufr. And his janazah was attended at least by 200,000 people. At least. And this is estimation of an official, uh, by the way, Saudi channel. They did the estimation when they covered his, his janazah. Rahimahullah ta'ala wa radiyallahu ta'ala an. So this is one of the things. And he left a legacy of huge number of books. So the printed books, more than 80. More than 80 printed books. And there are, by the way, almost the same number in manuscripts form yet to be published. So hopefully uh, Sayyid Ahmed and uh, other students of knowledge who are interested would work on that and, and publish that. So when you look into the beginning and the end, you realize who is that person. And when we go a little bit more into details, as I said, he started to learn uh, from very early age. And his father actually focused on him and he saw him a continuation of the tradition of the Maliki family. By the way, he's from a Dabbaq family too. But they got uh, Maliki, family, Maliki because of the Madhab. But also he's from the same family of uh, Dabbaq. So um, even scholars of Mecca, they noticed that Sayyid Muhammad was exceptional. And they used to joke with Sayyid Alawi bin Maliki, his father, Alawi bin Maliki. And he said, This is a branch that outperformed the, the origin, its origin. Which means yani, we are seeing a great scholar, even inshallah, better than, better than the, the father. And he continued his journey. He traveled. Uh, east and West, by the way, he had more than 200 sheikhs, 200 sheikhs. Just to give you a perspective, his chains of transmission, the Isnad, is published in three volumes. His chains of transmission is published in three volumes. One of his students, Sayyid Nabil al-Ghamri, published the, his Isnad in three volumes. This is just to mention his teacher and their connection to, up to the Prophet sallallahu and the authors of, of the book. So he traveled extensively and his link to knowledge was also exceptional. So my mother-in-law, she, she told me that they spent honeymoon in Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? Because he wanted to study with you. <laughs> he went to study for the, his master at the beginning and also with, with you. And she told me, many occasions we sleep. And then, you know, sometimes you wake up at night. She, when she used to wake up, she would find him holding a book and reading, studying in the middle of the night. Rahimahullah ta'ala wa radiyallahu anhu. So his, the time he spent and the aspiration that he had for knowledge was exceptional. But that was not separated from kind of the suluk, the mujahid, the struggle against the nafs. So he was among the people who of course, when you're all the great people, they, they used to do tahajjud. But especially at the beginning of his life, when he was uh, quite young and closer to the haram, he used to spend every single night in haram. And usually in doing tawaf. tawaf. So he would do at least seven tawafs, yani seven times seven, 49 times. Seven times seven, seven tawafs, seven times seven. And through that, of course, doing dhikr. And, um, so he had that great connection to to the haram. I think one of the best ways to also to, to learn from Sayyid Muhammad bin Alawi al-Maliki and from any scholar is to look into their daily life. 
how they used to spend their, what is the routine of their life, how they used to spend their time. So he used to, uh, as I said before, to wake up before Fajr. So usually around 3, 3 a.m. And then um, from home, he would go to the madrasa and do Qiyam al-Layl with, with his students up to Fajr time. And then he used to wake them up, by the way, by himself. And um, subhanAllah, there are very small things that he used to do which show his nobility and also signs of to teach us how to deal with our children, with the students, with the... So before going into their room, he had a stick. He would hit the stick on the ground a few times. If somebody is uncovered, if somebody doesn't want to see, to, to see him in a certain way, so they would be, no. And they, he would give him some ta- them some time, and then he would go into, into the room, rahimahullah ta'ala. It's just to give them a warning before he, he goes in. And then they do, as I said, Qiyam al-Layl. And after that, after Qiyam al-Layl, they pray Fajr together. They do awrad together up to Ishraq. Uh, and sometimes they finish the awrad before Ishraq. The students will continue. And he sometimes author at that time. He, he, he wrote, he, write, he used to write some of his books. So this is one of the times that he used to use for writing books. And then after the Ishraq, he would have... Uh, a nap and then after that nap he would start teaching um, so he would have before Dhuhr three to four he would have a very quick breakfast and then three or four teaching sessions before Salat al-Dhuhr one of them and again this is an interesting point there are as we know in each zawiya or madrasa students who are, who are dedicated for khidmah to serve others and that sometimes with rotation and sometimes they are dedicated for that so he would dedicate one or two sessions every single day before Dhuhr for those, the people of service. Other than the, the other students, which also he teach definitely other, other sessions. But he gave them a very special time to show them the nobility of, again, the mission that they are, they are doing. And then Salat al-Dhuhr, after Salat al-Dhuhr, again, uh, awrad and also um, sometimes a quick teaching session. And uh, around that time or before Dhuhr, it's the time if for some special durus when people come to study with him, like his, uh, his brother and other, some of the close uh, people to, to him. After uh, Dhuhr, also he would have lunch and then he would have another kind of nap. Then Asr, Awrad. After Asr, it's a time for, um, again, a bit of teaching, writing and preparing for his main teaching session which is after Maghrib where it's open for everyone so the previous kind of program is for the resident students of, of the madrasa and after Maghrib it's the open majlis I remember once I came to him at uh, time of Asr where he, he was doing multiple things I was surprised subhanallah so he was dictating a book and the students was writing so he was authoring but dictating and students was writing and somebody is reading to him from another book a third person was consulting him in his ears. I said, subhanAllah. <laughs> yeah, and he was doing like two, three things at, at, the same, at the same time. And then after Maghrib, as I said, they pray Maghrib. They do awrad after Maghrib. And then the main teaching session where he used to teach two to three books. Among them, usually the six books of hadith. Uh, and then many people would attend. So when it was at his house, around 300 to 400 people on a daily basis would attend his teaching session. Rahimahullah ta'ala wa radiyallahu an. Um, and then they would pray Isha, a bit of awrad, and then if somebody wants to speak to him, about 8.30 to 9 p.m. he would go to his family. And then his family time is between 8.30 to 12. 9 to 12, 8.30 to 12. Even during that time, it's one of the times at which also he writes books. And he would engage his family. So uh, my, my wife, uh, uh, she, she told me that it's quite common that he would say, go and bring me you know, a second uh, uh, volume of Sahih al-Bukhari. Go and give me Fath al-Bari, so and so. Go and give me, and then yalla, open that chapter and read for me. And then he will engage the family. And the first thing, by the way, when he would go to his family, 
because uh, there is a connection, so they would hear the dars, his teaching session, the main one, especially after Maghrib. He would ask them, what did you learn? <laughs> and he was asking a few questions, his, his daughters and his family members, rahimahullah. And then he sleep at 12, as I said, and then he would wake up around 3 a.m. And this is his, his schedule on daily, on daily basis. This is very normal, by the way. This is his normal schedule that where he spent. And through knowing the way they used to live and how they used to spend their time, I think this is one of the best ways to, to learn from them. And um, it's just a great blessing, as I said, when you get closer to them and see them when they travel and when they, how they spend their private time. And many times, when you think they, he was sleeping, actually, you find him and either doing dhikr, reading, or most of the time they are, subhanAllah, connecting with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. One of the most interesting, I think, connection between Sayyid Muhammad and other people, the connection with his students. It was amazing. And it goes natural that they used to call him Abuya, which is in our Hijazi dialect, my father. And this is for a reason that he used to take care of them as a father would do so. He used to spend on them, he used to teach them, he used to shelter them, he used to even take care of some of their families and some of the... So he really, he was like, like a father. Um, once uh, the students were going to Medina in a trip, before he was going, rahimahullah, and unfortunately, a major car accident happened uh, for the bus, and few of them passed away, rahimahumullah. And not all the people came to offer, you know, obituary for Sayyid Muhammad uh, because of uh, the loss of the students. And he said, he was very angry. He said, if anyone did not offer that as if I lost my own sons, I would be really angry with, with them. So for him, even the students who are coming from you know, abroad, uh, most of them from Indonesia, for, for, for him, he, he had that very strong connection. And this is why actually he was called uh, Abuya by them. They used to call him Abuya, my father. In a very, very, you, f you could feel the emotional uh, connection with, uh, with him, rahimahullah ta'ala. One of the main features of Sayyid Muhammad, rahimahullah ta'ala, I haven't seen any scholar who was organized like him. He was very, very organized in terms of following his uh, schedule, his time schedule. Everything is documented in his life. Even he, he used, he had a, a journal writing about everything. Even his encounter with royal families and with king, everything is written. And he used to write it by his own hands. Um, once my daughter was looking into the journal, and she randomly opened, and uh, she she said, and uh, today uh, Sayyid Ma'an al Dabbar visited us in our desert. So everything, yeah. and he, even you know, I was close to him, connected to him, but he, he would write these things because I was um, traveling at that time, living uh, away from Hijaz. So everything is documented, and he was, as I said, very very uh, organized, rahimahullah ta'ala. He had um, a small booklet. Whenever somebody would give him a gift he would write it down so that he returned the gift later on, which is the sunnah of, of the Prophet alayhi salatu He used to know, he used to teach daily. Not all the people would attend daily on daily basis. Some of them, they used to attend only on Wednesday. Some of them used to attend on Tuesdays, some of two days. So he knew each one when they attend. And if somebody did not attend twice, he would immediately call them. And he say, I haven't seen you for in the last two sessions. I hope everything is going okay. I hope it. So, subhanAllah, he, he's, he's, his personality and his the connection with the people around him and with like his students in specific was really uh, amazing. Sayyid, as we know, that one of the main things that he lived for and he kind of promoted. And his main mission is to defend the manhaj of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. And that's why probably you would imagine that one of the most celebrated work of among the 80 is Mafahim Yajibat Tusah, notions that must be corrected. Because 
that was his life project in a sense. And subhanAllah, um, uh, this is that book also he did like the last time he, he appeared on TV was about Mafahim Yajib Al Tusaha. So it was about notions need to be corrected. And that was in 2004, so just before he passed away. And I remember that was also the plan for the program to be earned in Ramadan. So the, the channel, they were trying to convince him to do it for 30 episodes throughout Ramadan. And he said, no, no, that's too much. And then they said, okay, Sayyid, let's do it 20. So to leave the Ashra Awakh, the last 10 days of Ramadan, people are busy with Qiyam, with other things. But at least let's do 20. Then he said, even 20, that's too much. He said, only 15. And this is the last time I will be on TV. You know, you wouldn't think about it that much. And subhanAllah, I remember every single day when the episode used to be aired, the presenter used to call Sayyid. And he said, ha Maulana, how is thing? Do you have any comments? Um, was anything that you didn't like? They said, no, Jazakumullah khair. And, and then the last episode, because he basically recorded and said 15, actually was aired on the day that he passed away. Rahimahullah. And he used to say, this is the last time. And I wouldn't do more than 15. But nobody understood. No, we, we have a saying in Mecca. This, we say usually, Mahadi ati habibu mot. Yani, nobody would understand the signs from a beloved one that it's a sign that he will pass away. No, no, we didn't think about it. And in this, I think there's a great, great message, which is as if he's saying, these are the notions I lived for. This is the methodology I wanted to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala where I'm trying to defend. And I lived all my life for that, and I end my life with that. It was a very, very clear uh, message. And for that, he struggled in his life. And not only his, he struggled, even his family struggled. He was exiled for a few years. Though that came with a lot of benefit to uh, when he was in Indonesia. He established many madrasas and he established many institutions and thousands and thousands of people are benefiting from him up to, to now. Even, by the way, if you go now to Indonesia, you will find his pictures all around the place, subhanAllah, out, out of, of that. So he struggled a lot. And I remember the first time I met him personally, in person, as a one-to-one. -one. Actually, it was the time when, when um, I proposed to, to his daughter. This is the first time one-to-one. -one. Of course, I knew him and I attended for him, but this is the first time. So he felt that I was very nervous. But as I said, Muhammad is quite, at the first glimpse, he's about Jalali. Yani, in the teaching session, you know, everyone is very calm. And, and sometimes, you know, <clears throat> you know, everyone would shiver. Rahimahullah. <laughs> <laughs> so I was really shivering and I was sweating. And, you know, you can imagine the, the situation. So he said, man, let me, let me tell you a story. I said, Bismillah. So he wanted to, to cool me down. He wanted to make things easy. He said, you know, when I was teaching in Haram, around... 1,000 people on daily basis they used to attend. I said, MashaAllah. And he said, when I go home, usually 500 would come with me. Alhamdulillah. Then he told me once, when I was going out of the haram from Bab al Salam as usual, and all the students behind me, and I was, you know, climbing the stairs, going up the stairs. And then somebody came from behind the pillar with a shoe and he hit me in my face. And he started laughing. I was shocked. And then he told me, this didn't happen once, twice. Coco, and he started laughing. For me, I was really surprised about the story and about how Sayyid Muhammad is laughing and why he's laughing. But later on, I started to realize what does it mean. Throughout his life, he went through tough times and difficult times. But
what seem to be <coughs> tests and trials. was full of divine blessings. Yani, <coughs> he, was, he was enjoying uh, the, the, the journey throughout the tests that he went through and the difficulties that he experienced. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was giving him sweetness to taste and things. Why is that? Because why he went through all these difficulties is it's for one purpose. For two things, actually. One, to defend the methodology of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala devoted him for that, chose him for that. And without him, I have to say, without Sayyid Muhammad bin Alam al-Maliki, I think the methodology of Ahl Sunnah and Jama'ah and many aspects of it would, would die out in some places at least. And the other thing, out of love for the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he was tasting, uh, subhanAllah, beauty and blessings. And, and one of, just to mention one of them. So he used to, um, to visit Sayyidatina Khadija radiallahu anha uh, in the last few months of his life, every single night. Every single night during the time of Sahar. So just before Fajr, after, between midnight and Fajr. Every single night. And uh, in one night, he would take with him his son, Sayyid Ahmed, and in one night, Sayyid Abdullah. And they used to, Sayyid Abdullah used to study at the university, Sayyid Ahmed used to, to work as a lecturer. So they found it difficult to go late night, every single night, to, with Sayyid. And then in the last month, so probably around Sha'ban or so, um, he turned to Sayyid Ahmed while they were visiting, around the visit, and he said, probably you, you're, يعني, you're puzzled, and you have the question, why I do so? Why am, I do visit Sayyidatina Khadija every single night, alhamdulillah. And he said, oh my son, Ahmed, every time, Every time I send <coughs> the salam to Sayyidatina Khadija, I hear the response in my ears. And other <coughs> many things with Sayyidina Hamza, with Sayyidatina Khadija, with Sayyidatina Fatima, radiallahu ta'ala anha. So the, the struggle that he went through Actually, this is what made him Muhammad Ali bin Malki. This is what made him the person we are speaking about in this moment. This is what made him uh, a person with millions and millions of followers around, around the, the world. SubhanAllah. So it was full of blessings despite the, the struggle that he went through and the difficulties for his family and for the people around, around him. There are many aspects, and I will end with that. I think we took more than I took more than I should, uh, and we will leave it to the questions. Also, Sayyid Muhammad um, was very, very kind, very funny in a sense. Um, the way he used to tell stories is unbelievable. I mean, you would just enjoy listening to him while he's talking about the stories and the things, and uh, and he would. Uh, if people around him, even his family, he would start to say, and they said, ask me why. I said, why I say it? And then he would respond. If we, if we don't ask him anything, he would stop. I said, ask me why? And then he would continue. So once he told me, come, come, come on, come, come close to me, sit next to me. I want to tell you a story. I said, Bismillah. He told me once, um, one of the greatest merchants in Hijaz approached me 
for a very difficult and tough situation he's going through. And he told me, Sayyid Muhammad, I need your, uh, we call it faza'a. Faza'a means your uh, immediate uh, kind of uh, response. And he means wilaya. And he told me, Sayyid Muhammad, that it was like a, a life and death issue. So it was very, very d d tough situation for the person. So he was very wealthy. The person was very wealthy. So he, he told him, okay, please prepare your private jet. I'm flying to Egypt. He asked a few of his students. Immediately they took the plane and they went to Sayyidina Abu Hassan al-Shadili radiallahu anhu. Uh, I will cut it short. He, mashallah, he used to. So he told me, and then we went into the darih of Sayyidina Abu Hassan al-Shadili. I asked the student to sit into a circle around the grave the tomb of Sayyidina Abu Hassan al-Shadili, we took out our misbaha and we started the dhikr. And he said, and the, the earth, the ground started to shake. So I lower my head and I said, you know, it's a great miracle and karama. He said, don't lower, don't shake your hand, head. This is not a karama, it was an earthquake. <laughs> 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 this is not a, don't shake your head, even. don't shake your head. This is not karama, it's an earthquake. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think not all these students of knowledge they used to enjoy being around him so his majlis his gathering the one I mentioned after Maghrib was a social hub was a scholarly hub was um, even a hub for needy people a hub for everything he was a center for the society of Mecca in Hijaz in general and, and, and Mecca in general uh, needy people, uh, people who want to consult him for social things, uh, key social figure would come and visit him. And uh, as we know in seasons, uh, many, many great scholars would come. Yani, a visit to Sayyid Muhammad house, rahimahullah ta'ala, during Hajj, would equal to several trips to meet different scholars around the world. Because you're going to find all the great people you might think about sitting in, in his gathering. And many people, two, three thousand people would attend, especially during Hajj time. And he would feed all of them and he would honor all of them. Everyone will go out fed spiritually, physically, and many of them even with, with gifts. And he would see the great scholar around you. Even for some regions, especially in Indonesia and Malaysia, because of he spent a lot of time there, part of the program of Hajj, when they give the program before people come, you know, you know, Arafah, Muzdalifa, Sayyid Muhammad and Adawi Maliki house. And they come with buses. They come with buses. That's why, especially in Indonesia and Malaysia, as I said, he has great, great uh, influence. Uh, in, when he passed away, uh, three presidents, ex-presidents of Indonesia came actually for, for the Aza. Many officials from all over the world, rahimahullah ta'ala wa radiyallahu an, they came. Um, on the day that he passed away, he had a, like, um, uh, subhanallah, ish al sukkar bil, marad al sukkar ish, Malik? Diabetes, diabetes, yeah. So he had a, a high level, sugar level. He went for the hospital and then he was discharged. After that, he went, rahimahullah ta'ala, on the night of 15th. People came to him. He was very well. He walked without a stick even which we haven't seen for years actually, not months. So he, he looked very healthy. But the thing that SubhanAllah gave a hint when um, just before Sahur time, Sayyid Abbas, his brother was around. He was a great munshid, very famous munshid. And he said, uh, Sayyid Muhammad said to Sayyid Abbas, Sayyid Abbas, Sayyid Hussein Hashim, Sayyid Hussein Hashim is the greatest munshid in Medina. He was rahimahullah. So he said Sayyid Hussein Hashim was always fearful of death and talking about death. But just before he passed away, he made inshad of a qasida, which is in mittu fahfuruli qabra bijani bil habibi kana shibra. If I passed away, then dig for me a grave just beside the beloved, even if it was, you know, that short and that small. So he said, can you do in chad of that, Ya Sayyid Abbas? He said, oh, my brother Muhammad, why? We want to speak about death now. He said, no, no, please, please, do in chad for it. And Sayyid Abbas did in chad. And subhanAllah, he went inside his private room and um, uh, he, he made the intention for 
uh, fasting. Uh, and uh, th there was the students with him. He told him, cover me well. Uh, he was uh, dressed properly. By the way, Sayyid Muhammad used almost to dress formally when he used to sleep, as if he's meeting, subhanAllah, things and preparing for the great dreams. So he said, uh, please cover me well. And then, subhanAllah, rahimahullah, he passed away while he was surrounded by his books on the night of 15 of Ramadan, just few, one or two hours before Fajr, around one hour before Fajr, after he made the intention of Siyam, rahimahullah ta'ala. And we ask uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate his rank in Jannah and uh, multiply the reward he got in, in many falls and uh, allow, inshallah, all what his students, all those who benefit from his book to for him to have portion of the reward of that and allow us, inshallah, to benefit from his uh, light and his nur and his knowledge. And since we have uh, mentioned him this night in this blessed place, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be connected to him and to be in his heart so that when he make dua for the people uh, he knew uh, to be among, inshallah, we be, we be among that. And uh, we ask him azza wa to reunite us all with him and all with our great mashaykh and great awliya around the world with our beloved Prophet alayhi salatu wa salam wa sallallahu ala sayyidina muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam I'm so sorry it took so so long You mentioned he had several awrad every day. You mentioned he had several awrad every day, Rahmanullah. What were the content of these awrad? And was there something that you recommend? Yeah, he usually used to recite Al Ba'alawi awrad and Shadiri awrad mainly, and also some of the awrad of Sidi Ahmed Bidri. So one of the things that he highly, highly recommend form of salawat and tahleel. The tahleel is La ilaha illallah Muhammadur Rasulullah fi kulli lamhatin wa nafasin adada ma wasi'ha ilmullah of Sidi Ahmed Bidris al-Fasi. And actually, subhanAllah, just a few months before he passed away, he advised me to, he said, let me teach you uh, a dhikr. And uh, he asked me to, to do it. And the other is um, he used to love uh, salawat, uh, salat al-Fatih of Sidi Ahmed al-Tijani. Um, especially before teaching, before writing. So always before teaching, he would be reciting salawat of uh, Sidi Ahmed Tijani, Salat al-Fatih, rahimahullah ta'ala. Um, the other awrad is, again, he, he used to do Wird al-Latif, Ratib al-Imam al-Haddad, Hizb al-Bahar, Surat al-Waqi'ah, Surat Yaseen, uh, Wird al-Imam al-Attas, and other awrad for different occasions. Among them, by the way, Dala'il, among them is uh, al Badriya. So the names of Ahl Badr. Jaliyat al Kadr of Imam al Barzanji. Whenever he, he had a, a tough test or trial, then he would, he would recite that with the students. And he used to do it on a weekly basis. But when there are something which is difficult that he was going through, yani the toughest episode with the royal family actually was. Um, he was reciting, uh, he was alone actually, but he was reciting uh, Ahil Badr, the names of Ahil Badr. Yes. Sheikh, I was just wondering, maybe you should elaborate slightly on this defense of the methodology of Ahl Shina with Jama'ah. What were the entailments of that? What was the significance of it? What were the specific challenges he was facing at that time that made it such a difficult moment for him and showed the great courage that he had in the face of? Have your position in that yeah, I think uh, what happened is the the methodology of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah and the scholars of Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. He he saw himself that their influence, their post in the Haram, their uh, public appearances started to to disappear with a very dangerous alternative discourse. And he was, by the way, again, this is one of his insights. He was looking into the consequences of that. It's not about fanatism for a certain madhabs or no. For him, he was like a tent for all the Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah. And as we know, 
The definition of Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah is quite clear. Scholars agreed upon followers of one of the four Sunni madhabs in fiqh. Followers one of the aqaid of Ahl al-Sunnah wa Jama'ah, Ash'aris or Maturidis. And those of Ahl al-Athar are part of Ash'aris in a sense, those who do tafwid. يعني. So it's really restricted to, to that. And then being affiliated or at least lover of the, the, the turuq of Ahl Allah, which is the, the, the tasawwuf. What he was seeing and why he defended that quite in a very firm way, first of all, he, I was, he had an insight about the consequences of that. That would lead to extremism. And why is that? Because one of the notions that was spreading is what, it, what they called نَحْنُ رِجَالُ وَهُمْ رِجَالُ As the great scholars are men, we are men. What does it mean? We shouldn't follow their own opinion. And removing the authority at all, which means also demolishing the way they used to reach to the conclusions that reached to. They build through the sharia, the ahkam and the rulings. And so he was seeing that things will move from being scientific and bounded by a real methodology, well-defined methodology into whims and desires and what I see and what I think. And that would lead to arrogance that would lead to pride and once the person become arrogant and proud of himself he wouldn't see the truth as the prophet sallallahu said about uh, kibr um subhanallah um, the, the Prophet ﷺ gave sign about arrogance, which is basically that you, you deny realities or you don't follow the reality and also you look down at people. And this is what happened. So they were coming up with their own opinion and condemning other people as misguided. And we reached to extremism. We reached to after that to, you know, spreading kufr. And after that, to condemn it, started by bid'ah, calling people mubtadi'ah, people, people of bid'ah, people of bid'ah, and reach up to kufr, and it reached up to that by, about killing people, actually, and beyond that. So he was seeing that, that would lead to that kind of um, mess, one. Second, the, the way the sharia was preserved throughout centuries is being lost. Third, which is also very important, the connection with the Prophet ﷺ being lost and not valued as it used to be. And he saw that as signs of actually destruction for the Ummah and not uh, um, out like for the Ummah to, to flourish. So he defended Manhaj Ahl Sunnah wa Jama'ah because what he saw, uh, the consequences that was expect, expected out of that and also to preserve the mainstream Sunni which was working for centuries and centuries and centuries so if it was successful it should be successful we should just follow it we are not allowed to change and come up with new things if we have the right methodology and we just should abide and kind of learn that that well and because of that he was as we have heard he was called as uh, his acts as kufur and then he was exiled and he was banned from teaching uh, in public he lost his post in the haram. He lost his post in uh, also at the university. Uh, actually, when he felt that he will lose it, he, he left before he was asked to do so. But it was quite kind of uh, clear. So um, as a responsibility for future generations and continuation of the tradition, he did all that sacrifice. And because of the negative consequences that he uh, actually had that inside that going to happen if things were not restored and preserved. Just have one question. If there was anything that he took from uh, say uh, Muhammad ibn Al-Awwad Halawi um, that you learned, uh, what would you say that is? And, uh, yeah, what would you say? That the way the way of love is the only way that could get you closer to the sahaba than any other thing 
if you want to compete with the Sahaba and with the real Salaf and through uh, our acts of worship or through our knowledge or through our virtues and values and akhlaq, we wouldn't be able to match it. But love can't fold all this distance, all those centuries, and take you from this century into that century. The person would be with those whom he loves. And if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you with that love, it's a sign that he loves you. Because he says, وَسَوْفَ يَأْتِي اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring people whom he loves and they love him. He started by he loves them. So if you love him and his messenger, وسلم, it's a sign that eternally he loved you. Because it does start from, from him. So I think this is the most important lesson that love fold the distance. Love make up for the shortcomings in our intentions. Love make up for the shortcomings in our acts of worship. Love make up for the shortcomings in our aspiration. I think um, there are many things, but I think his generosity was uh, astonishing. Um, as I said before, he used to spend from his own money on the students. He used to feed thousands of people. Just to give you perspective, just during the Hajj season, out of honoring and present just the food which is presented to people at his house, more than 100 sheep during the Hajj season. The, the way he spent is just unbelievable. The way he spends was un unbelievable. Um, and his generosity is not only about money. It's only about time, about love that he shares with others, about how he did. He wants people to benefit, the way he wanted people to benefit from, from him. So I think generosity was one of the uh, astonishing attributes, subhanAllah, from, from Sayyid. Um, and as I said, subhanAllah, after he passed away, we knew how many households used to live through things that he used to send, but we didn't know about. Rahimahullah wa radiyallahu anhu. Allah, um, I think uh, dedication, for example, because he was uh, dedicated to writing and he felt that one of his main mission is writing, he used to have a small suitcase always with him. Whenever he had a chance, there are times we know that he used to write, usually, after Fajr, after Asr and during family time. But also he used to hold that suitcase with him. In the car, he would take it out and he start to write. Um, when he used to visit people and then nothing really going on, he will kind of take it and start writing. So dedication and that lead him to plan for the moments where, so he was looking for moments when he had time and then he will utilize. So utilization, dedication, Clearly what he wants to do is quite clear and then he would just do it and utilize each single uh, moment. Even when he used to travel, on the way he used to teach and he used to write and he used to... So dedication, I think, one of the important things. So if you know what you want to do, prepare for it. Whenever you have a chance or an opportunity, just utilize it and do, do what, what you, uh, you are dedicated or you aspire to do. And that, of course, needs to be noble things, not, not other things.